Thank you very much for staying till the very end of the, uh, today's uh, workshop. The, in this closing plenary session, uh, let's see the actionable paths to the future. The first speaker will be Professor John Twitz of Monash University, where he chairs the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. Most important of all, he's also the chairman of SDSN Association. He is my boss of bosses. <laughs> and, well, Professor Twitz has had a very interesting career. Started out as a lawyer, then served as mayor of South Melbourne before becoming deputy premier of the state of Victoria from 1999 until 2007. And he has switched, showing his intellectual versatility, versatility into the area of sustainable development where he has become a recognized global leader. Australia, in the, despite being distracted in the midst of COVID-19 in 2021, bestowed upon him the Order of Australia, the highest honor that a country could, be, could confer on someone. So, John, welcome. The stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, Wing, and I don't think anyone is your boss. Uh, I don't know any, anyone who could do that job. Uh, but thank you so much for uh, hosting this marvellous event, and thank you to Sunway also. And uh, thank you to Tantri Jeffrey Chia, who actually shares that same honour that I have, and uh, Australia is very proud that uh, Tantri Jeffrey Chia has spent a lot of his formative years in Australia uh, and now has contributed so much here. Wing has asked me to speak about the next steps in achieving global sustainable development. And I think the first step is commitment. It's commitment by people of goodwill, like yourselves, to the goal of sustainable development. And I think the fact that we're all here on a Saturday morning talking about sustainable development, sharing ideas is a pretty good start. Uh, normally I'd be doing the week shopping right now, so I'm not sure what we're going to eat this week, but I feel my brain will be well nourished. And I'm sure it's the same for all of you. The second step is to bring knowledge and expertise to the task. And that's really what SDSN does, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We now bring together researchers and educators from around 2,000 universities around the world in 143 countries. This is by far the biggest global network of its kind. And we're harnessing that expertise to make a difference at a country level, but really importantly at a regional level, like this discussion that we're having here at Sunway. I do um, want to start by mentioning an opportunity, a new opportunity for researchers and uh, educators in universities to increase their impact through the media. And that's something called 360 Info. 360 Info is an independent, uh, non-profit public information service that disseminates information from scientists and experts into the media. It's like a Reuters for researchers. And currently the way it works is that journalists work with the researchers to produce articles which are then passed on to some 1,500 newsrooms around the world. And therefore researchers can get a platform for their ideas. This uh, 360 Info is based at, at Monash University, but we now have a network of 
journalists around the world supporting that, including here in, in Malaysia. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, 360 Info will be partnering with SDSN on an upcoming special report on removing obstacles to implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals in the Indo-Pacific region. And I expect that that will be in major newspapers throughout the region. So I do urge you, if as a researcher you're, you're interested in this, to uh, find out more information through info at 360info.org. Well, what are these next steps that are needed in global sustainable development? As we heard yesterday, there's much to do. We're at the halfway point of the Sustainable Development Goals to 2030, and unfortunately, we're way off track. Uh, the Sustainable Development Report, which the SDSN produces every year, did actually have some positives. And I noticed that Malaysia, for example, is, has done well on poverty reduction and is improving in that way. But across the whole world, not a single sustainable development goal is on track to be met at a global level by 2030. There was a, a small improvement between 2015 and 2019, but not nearly enough to meet the targets by 2030. But then COVID-19 pushed us back further. And I think one of the most disturbing findings in, in that report this year is that there's a risk that by 2030, the gap between the high income countries and the low income countries in SDG achievement will be even greater in 2030 than it was in 2015. So the, that gap is increasing. And as we heard also yesterday, the Paris climate targets are off track and we're already 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial levels, headed towards potentially three degree global heating, which will be disastrous. Now, at the front of that sustainable development report, there's a section which you might be interested to read. And it is a paper prepared by the SDSN Leadership Council on how we can turn this around. And it's titled, How to Achieve the SDGs, the SDSN Framework. And I thought it was worth this morning highlighting the recommendations that the Leadership Council have made. The first recommendation is to adopt the SDG stimulus that the Secretary General of the United Nations has advocated for to close the financing gap between the rich countries and the poorer countries. And essentially this requires of the wealthier countries to put additional capital into the multilateral development banks and into sustainable development to support lower and lower middle income countries. And allied with that recommendation is the second recommendation that we made, which was to endorse reform of the global financial architecture. Because as things stand at the moment, low income countries simply can't get access to finance at reasonable rates. And in fact, this has got worse since COVID. Uh, Low income countries, for example, represent about 8% of the population of the world, yet they get 0.4% uh, of global investment. And low and middle income countries represent 43% of global population, but get just 11.9% of investment. Now, recently you would have seen uh, about the summit for the new global financing pact which was hosted by President Macron in, in Paris in June. And this summit did raise these issues, which is positive. But so far, that has not resulted in what is really needed, which is a significant boost in funding for the multilateral development banks and for low-income countries. And essentially, it is the wealthy countries that have to make that commitment. The third recommendation from the Leadership Councils is that countries should adopt 
long-term sustainable development pathways to 2030 and 2050. Now, now these longer-term pathways are really something that Jeff has pioneered over many years, Jeff Sachs. And for me, they've been a real awakening in thinking because so often in government, what we do is we start where we are and then we think, what can we politically achieve? And that's about as far as we go. But the whole idea of these long-term pathways with backcasting is to set a clear quantitative target for the future, for 2030, for 2050, and then work backwards, backcast from there to design the innovations and the investment that is needed to achieve that long-term target. And when you think that way, it totally changes the way that you do policy. And that's what the Leadership Council has suggested that we should be doing across sustainable development. I have to say I'm really pleased that just last week, the Australian Government announced that it would be working with the community and experts to design long-term sectoral pathways for decarbonisation in the key sectors, that is in uh, energy, industry, the built environment, agriculture and land, transport and resources. And Climate Works, which I uh, chair, has been calling for this for years, so we're very pleased that last week it was announced. And we're also pleased that we've been asked to be working on that. Uh, project. At the time, the government also announced that the circular economy would be a cross-cutting issue for all of those sectoral plans. And adopting a circular economy approach is vital if we're going to meet SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. But it also is the way that we can start to get business to change so that it decouples growth and profit from environmental degradation. And I'm pleased uh, personally to have been asked by the Australian Government to chair the Circular Economy Ministerial Advisory Group that will be designing and recommending the regulations and the financial incentives that you need to achieve a circular economy. But of course, these long-term plans shouldn't just be confined, confined to decarbonisation. We need them for the other major transformations that are needed for sustainable development, like quality education, or universal health care, or uh, sustainable food and land, sustainable cities and the digital economy. And the one recommendation I'd particularly make when these long-term plans are being developed is to ensure that they include the policies and financial commitments that are going to be needed to, to achieve them. It's not enough just to have a plan. You've got to back it up with regulation in, and policy, in my experience. The fourth recommendation we make is for countries to pre present voluntary national reviews of their sustainable development performance at regular intervals. As we pointed out in that paper, in the USA, they have not yet presented a single voluntary national review. Australia has only presented one. I'm really pleased to note that Malaysia has committed to presenting a voluntary national review every four years. And uh, I think put one in in 2017 and also in 2021. But that regular commitment is almost more important than anything because it shows that the government is going to have to come back to the community and say, this is how we're going. But in my view, simply reporting is not enough. And that's all the voluntary national reviews do. What we need is a system of SDG governance that ensures that sustainable development is part of the mainstream government processes, most importantly, the budget. If the sustainable development goals aren't in the budget and we're not using the sustainable development goals to help design the budget, they're not going to happen because that's where government makes its decisions. The fifth recommendation is 
something Jeff talked about this yesterday is around peaceful cooperation to accelerate achievement of the goals at a time of geopolitical tension. Uh, we are living in dangerous times. Ukraine, the US-China tensions, which spill over into, into this region as well. And it's not just about defence. We're seeing now how these tensions are influencing investment and trade. And so now, in many cases, trade is becoming another weapon in the geopolitical conflict. And some people call this the geo-economy. And of course, that undermines the ability for countries to do what they do best. And we come back into ourselves and end up using trade and investment for security purposes. And I think this is a time when the SDSN, which is an organisation of people of goodwill all around the world, has a real role to play. When we are able to pull together, as we have here in this conference, people from many countries in a spirit of goodwill. And I believe the SDSN has an even greater responsibility now at this time of geopolitical tension. The sixth and final recommendation is that all countries should commit to accelerating sustainable development goal progress to 2030 and to adopt more ambitious targets to 2050. Now this is quite interesting because for the first time we're saying let's look at what should happen after 2030, after the 2030 period of the goals is completed. Those targets are critical and I certainly know from my time as a minister that without targets nothing much happens. Basically you just respond to the day's events. But I'm also uh, really pleased that we're now looking at targets beyond 2030 to that 2050. There's a lot of discussion about what should happen with the Sustainable Development Goals after 2030 and I've had conversations with academics who say, well, the SDGs haven't worked, we should try something different. I disagree with that. I think it's misguided. The achievement of global consensus around the, the goals, the Sustainable Development Goals between 2012 and 2015, was extraordinary. To think of the world as it is, able to come together and set out a blueprint for the future, unanimously was an extraordinary achievement and unfortunately I don't think it's likely to be repeated with the world as it is today. So if we start with some new system and go back to scratch, I think we'll just be talking for another decade about what it should be. Why not use the framework we've got which works well but set the new more ambitious targets for 2050? and understand that the problem with the SDGs is not the framework, it's the implementation and the lack of finance. And so let's focus more on better implementation and governance and more on better uh, finance, especially for low-income countries, rather than dreaming up some new system. Now, the final point that the Leadership Council emphasised was the importance of regional collaboration and cooperation across a region like Southeast Asia or C Central Asia, for example. The Sustainable Development Goals do require strong cooperation at the regional level. Just think of how many things we share, like rivers, forests, fishing zones, wetlands, and we need to cooperate to protect them. Renewable energy makes much more sense if it's done regionally because we can through a larger area, share much bigger facilities, which cuts down the, the cost. And that particularly applies also to storage, as well as the renewable energy generators. And that's the sort of thing that we're looking at through the Asian Green Future Project that you heard about yesterday. But it's not just about infrastructure. Regional cooperation also should include finance, carbon markets, technical and social innovations, and importantly, policies. 
because it is policies that determine whether things happen. And unfortunately, what we often have is policies that are inconsistent or not complementary. So more and more, if we can have policies which are complementary across regions, we're going to get better results. And I think there's a real role here for SDSN and the Asian Green Future Project in supporting evidence-based policy and pushing back against bad policies like fossil fuel subsidies, which frankly are holding back action in many parts of this region. And that's, I think, where the Asian uh, Green Future Project is going to go. It's going to be working with closer collaboration with the decision makers, with the governments, so that we can focus on the incentives and the policies that will make a real difference. Thank you. Our next speaker is someone I met in Jeff and I met him in August 2001 because at that time we were tasked by the Deputy Prime Minister of China to help formulate the Western China Development Initiative. And, Ms. and Professor Zhao at that time, being the outstanding scholar in Sichuan province, he was tasked to be our counterpart to formulate this national strategy. Well, he's certainly come a long way from Sichuan province way back in a corner of China to the center of action in Beijing, where he was Director General of Industries at the Development Research Center, the think tank of the Chinese government. And he is now the Executive Vice President of the Center for International Knowledge on Development. Because after, when, after China started the Belt Road Initiative, they felt they needed more analytical guidance. And Professor Chow was tasked with that job to set the framework for Chinese, for direct, for a framework to guide Chinese Belt Road Initiative in a clean, green direction. <laughs> Professor Chow, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Wing and dear colleague. Morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be uh, present here today. I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizer, especially Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the Professor Wu, for kindly inviting me. I, I have learned uh, a great deal from yesterday and this morning. Uh, in return, I hope uh, I can share something uh, you find interesting and valuable. Uh, let me focus on the uh, um, uh, the following uh, three uh, aspects. Uh, the first, China's progress and the practice uh, in implementing uh, SDGs, and the second, major uh, uh, challenges and opportunities to global implementation since 2020, and the last, the next step. Uh, let me go uh, first, uh, China's progress and the practice of SDGs and uh, China attaches uh, great importance to the 2030 Agenda uh, for Sustainable Development, and many SDGs have witnessed remarkable uh, achievements in China over the past uh, years. Uh, today, I will share the latest progress on uh, some key targets uh, from the link of four uh, PS, uh, namely uh, the people, uh, prosperity, uh, planet, and partnership. Uh, because of the time constraint, I just choose a few SDG uh, uh, goals. Number one, uh, people. Uh, progress in uh, home development. First of all, uh, China has made a historic achievement of adding uh, absolute uh, poverty. Uh, by the end of the 2020, China completed its poverty uh, eradication uh, target with uh, altogether uh, 
98.90 million, uh, million uh, rural residents uh, living under the current uh, uh, policy uh, line uh, lifted out of poverty. Uh, amid the SDG 10 years ahead of schedule, uh, uh, as you can see uh, in figure one, uh, since uh, 2015, also big, uh, big, big number uh, lifted out of poverty. Uh, secondly, China has uh, successfully uh, uh, safeguarded the food security of more than 1.4 billion uh, people. And thirdly, uh, China has made great advance in ensuring uh, health lives, uh, promoting the well-being for all at all stages. And, uh, uh, for uh, SDG number four, uh, China has implemented nine years compulsory uh, education since 2011. Uh, in, uh, in last years, the complete, uh, complete, uh, complementation uh, uh, rate. <laughs> and for uh, SDG number five, China has uh, tried to achieve uh, gender equality uh, through a range of measures. And uh, uh, for number uh, uh, SDG number six, and uh, China, uh, the access to safe and uh, affordable uh, drink water for uh, all has been achieved with uh, uh, eradication of absolute poverty. Uh, the second uh, number two uh, prosperity uh, progress in uh, 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 social economic development. Uh, for uh, SDG number seven, by the end of uh, 2015, uh, China has achieved the full coverage of power service, uh, realizing uh, this SDG uh, 15 years ahead of schedule. And uh, uh, for uh, SDG number eight, uh, China's uh, 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 its per capita GDP uh, increased to 12,741 US dollars in 2022. For SDG number nine, China has made tremendous achievements in infrastructure and uh, industrialization. Uh, by the end of uh, 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 February uh, this year, uh, a total of uh, uh, more than 200 million of, uh, 5G uh, base station uh, have been put into operation uh, national world. And uh, to achieve uh, SDG number 10, uh, China needs to narrow four gaps, uh, uh, income gap, rural urban gap, uh, development gap, and the regional development gap, and the public service gap. And for SDG number 11, uh, China has built the world largest housing uh, security system and improved the living conditions for more than 200 million people. And for SDG number 16, China has uh, taken enormous, uh, enormous efforts to uh, fight uh, crime, uh, uh, prevent violence, and, and so on. Okay, the number three uh, piece, uh, planet, uh, progress in human nature uh, harmony. And for SDG 12, between uh, 2011 and uh, 2021, China's energy consumption per unit of GDP uh, dropped by 26.4%, uh, uh, saving about uh, 1.4 billion tons of standard coal. Uh, for SDG thir number 13, uh, China has pledged to peak carbon uh, emission uh, by 2030 and reach carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, in 2021, China's carbon uh, dioxide emission per unit of GDP was reduced by uh, about 50% uh, uh, compared with uh, 2005. Uh, so you can, uh, uh, you can look at the finger eight. The environmental pollution is also uh, getting uh, under control. And for number, uh, SDG number 14, uh, the average annual proportion of good quality water in coastal areas uh, has risen to uh, 80, uh, about 82 percent in uh, last years. Uh, for the SDG number 15, China has made a bi uh, biodiversity conversation a national strategy and incorporated it into development uh, planning of all regions and sectors. The last P, partnership. A progress in global uh, partnership over the past years, China has done everything within uh, its capacity to help other developing countries achieve SDGs through development assistance, capacity building, and knowledge sharing. 
Uh, the number of countries uh, receiving Chinese assistance has uh, increased for more than uh, 110 to more than 160. And China has uh, also carried out uh, over uh, 6,000 capacity building projects that benefit a lot of people in developing countries. In September 2021, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed the Global Development Initiative to help accelerate the realization of SDGs. On the GDI, China has taken a whole set of measures to help other countries implement the 2030 agenda, ranging from new financial resources to set up new institutions like the Global Development Promotion Center and also uh, my institution, CIKD. Uh, and we are entrusted with three uh, uh, tasks under the GDI, including publish global development report, organizing the global development forum, and establish a global knowledge network for development. Uh, so the finger nines you can see. So based on the above facts, I would like to share some uh, China's progress in achieve uh, uh, the hard win uh, progress. I hope that it would be used for reference for the uh, uh, implementation of the 2030 agenda in Asian country and uh, uh, beyond. F firstly, uh, I think the firm political will. The firm uh, uh, political will is a precondition for the implementation of 2030 agenda. The 2030 agenda had been fully integrated into China five years plan, at national, at provincial, and the sectorial levels. A second, a shifting a development philosophy towards sustainable development, China's new development philosophy uh, includes uh, innovative, uh, coordinate, green, open, and shared shared development. It is in harmony with the 2030 agenda and also fits China's demand for high quality development at the current stage. The third is a competent bureaucracy and effective implementation mechanisms. Political will and the development philosophy cannot be translated into results without effective implementation mechanism. China was among the first to establish an interministerial mechanism of 45 ministry, ministry and the commissioner uh, to ensure the implementation of 2030 agenda. Relevant uh, ministry are led agency and the local government assumes the uh, uh, main responsibility of implementation, thus uh, forming an effective structure comprising uh, the national, subnational, and the local levels. The fourth is a broad social consensus. A social-wide understanding, acceptance, and uh, participation uh, holds the key to continue the effective impl implementation of 2030 agenda. And the last uh, five, uh, a global partnership. Now, since global partnership, a stronger con uh, global partnership is essential to the implementation of 2030 agenda. Uh, China believes in a community with a shared future for mankind and has learned from the experience of other uh, countries, especially developed countries, and contributed to global implementation of SDGs through uh, deep international cooperation. Uh, my, uh, my talk, the second part, is the major challenges and the opportunities to global impl implementation of SDGs since 2020. Since 2020, the world has changed a lot and has been experienced at least four, challenge, four changes of global scale, namely COVID-19 pandemic, structure shift of the global political and economic landscape, and the digital transformation, and the green transition. Uh, these changes bring both challenges and opportunities for global sustainable development and has also uh, uh, have implementation for China. First, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, pandemic has uh, weakened on whom uh, life and health and left a lasting impact on global economic and social development. Uh, if you look at a number of development indicators have, uh, have been reversed, such as uh, Human Development Index, Global Poverty Rate, and the Global uh, Life Expectancy, and so on. Uh, despite this provide a negative impact, the COVID-19 uh, forced the humanity to speed up development of medical technology, strengthen public health, cooperation, and better prepare for future uh, pandemics. 
Uh, second, the global economic and political landscape is changed dramatically. In such a shifting landscape, globalization force uh, face a stronger uh, hindering. Uh, protectionism and uh, unilateralism are on the rise, and the crucial about uh, movement, uh, products, service, technology, and the talents are increasingly uh, constrained. Uh, the global division of labor is, grown, is growing more uh, fragmented, and with localization, decentralization, and regional of industry and the supply chain. However, we still can find the upside of shifting. Uh, the developing countries are having a growing voice in global governance and are building a, a fair and a more uh, equitable international orders as well as more balanced global economy. Uh, so I, I think uh, the localization and the regionalization of industrial uh, and the supply chain, uh, despite its downside and, uh, and also uh, this may uh, all the way for China, uh, I think, uh, uh, cooperation. The digital transmo uh, transformation is a double-edged sword of our world. It brings enormous challenges, such as uh, uh, divided, uh, digital divided among countries between rural urban areas and uh, between genders. Uh, 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 and most significantly, uh, significantly uh, digital technology has changed the competitive advantage of competitive, uh, competitiveness of developed and developing countries. Uh, but uh, uh, if used properly, uh, uh, digital technology can also bring a great opportunity for economic and social development and then challenge, uh, challenges. So uh, the, uh, they have a petition to raise, uh, to raise uh, productivity, but also pro provide the unique uh, opportunities for countries to accelerate, uh, accelerate economic growth and connect the citizens to service and jobs. The, the last uh, challenge and the opportunity is climate change. Uh, of course, the climate change is, is much concern for everybody. Uh, but uh, on the uh, uh, you know the uh, climate change uh, uh, will bring also a new uh, opportunity to global sustainable development. Uh, the bow for uh, make, uh, make a red trace of uh, our times uh, bring uh, uh, humanity at a historic crossroad. Uh, how to address challenges and the size opportunity depend on each country's domestic efforts as well as international cooperation. So my last, uh, uh, my, uh, last part is the next step. Uh, as the world is approaching the middle way uh, point of 2030 agenda, it is high time to look back uh, to the way we passed and uh, to take a way forward uh, with a stronger determination and more concurrent uh, measures. In the future, China will uh, continue uh, our uh, domestic efforts in achieve SDGs through Chinese modernization, which strive uh, for uh, harmony uh, between humanity and the nature and uh, pursues uh, common prosperity uh, for all. Uh, by, 20, uh, by 2035, China will strive to uh, increase uh, uh, its per capita GDP to be on par uh, with that of a middle-level uh, developed country, uh, build a modern, modernized economy with a new industrialization, uh, informalization, uh, urbanization, and agricultural modernization, uh, bring people better and happier life uh, with equitable access to basic public service, broadly established uh, equal, friendly ways of worker uh, and life, and largely uh, accomplished the goal of building a beautiful China. In the meantime, China will continue to build a community with a shared future for mankind through Chinese modernization. Uh, <clears throat> We will work with uh, partners to build a world of last, uh, lasting peace, a world of universal security, a world of common prosperity, an open and inclusive world, and a clean and beautiful world. Uh, China will uh, step up uh, uh, our efforts to strengthen cooperation with other developing countries, especially the uh, Southeast Asian neighbors, and reach the goal through the BRI and the GDI, uh, like Wings uh, mentioned. Finally, I can congratulate uh, once again uh, the co-working of the meeting uh, by Sustainable Development Solution Network and the Jeffrey Che Foundation. Thank you very much. The ASEAN Workshop on Sustainable Development has been very lucky that it has enjoyed the support of uh, the Lao People's Democratic Republic 
since the beginning. The, this is our third meeting. The foreign, foreign minister of Laos had handed the first two because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is in charge of the coordination of SDGs in Laos. This year, the minister is busy and we are very lucky to have in his place Mr. Sovana Fong Wang, because I cannot pronounce the first name. <laughs> Mr. Sovana Fong, who is the Deputy Director of the Department of International Organizations. Mr. Uh, Sofa Novong, please. Excellency, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. At the outset, on behalf of uh, my government, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the government of Malaysia, Sunway University, and the UN uh, Sustainable Development Solution Network for uh, organizing and inviting me to the to the to the important forum. Let me start my presentation by introducing uh, briefly the implementation of the SDG in the Lao PTR. Seeing adoption in 2015, the National Steering Committee. Uh, no as an SC for SDG implementation was set up in 2017, shared by our Prime Minister, Prime Minister. with members of the committee from the all concerned ministry and agency. The National SDG Secretariat um, that uh, part the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of uh, Planning and Investment of Laos, and the focal point in Lai Ministry were appointed to lead and take ownership of the SDG to ensure a smooth coordination and collaboration. Throughout the last few years, the Lao government has adjusted great importance to the two and been putting great effort in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and had made many remarkable achievements, namely the national SDG mechanism has been well established underlining the own of government approach to ensure localization and implementation of SDG in all sector concern. In this context, the government has adopted uh, 238 SDG indicators, and most of them were integrated into the eight and nine uh, national socio-economic five-year plan. Furthermore, national national wide SDG advocacy campaign and national SDG roadmap have been launched to promote the mechanism in creating horizontal and vertical policy coherence. Importantly, SDG localization into various development sectors at both local and national level has also been key area of focus. The Lao PDR took also ownership by adopting the National SDG 18, that leave life safe from unexplored outland, uh, known as UXO, to address its relevant program. It is estimated that around 8.7 million hectares of land is contaminated by UXO, which pose a barrier for socio-economic development. The decade of SDG 18 is to ensure that by 2030, all no UXO uh, contamination in high priority 
area and all village defined define as poor are clear and uh, well as the reduction of annual costality from UXO and uh, providing support to UXO survival and victim. Number of national instruments and have also formed to guide the implementation of SDG 18 and to ensure better linkage with other SDG in Lao PDR. The Lao PDR has made a number of significant progress uh, of the in, on implementation of success, successive NS EDP as well as the SDG. The country continues to enjoy political, political stability, social order, and continue economic growth over the past year and made uh, tremendous progress in uh, reducing poverty. The absolute poverty has reduced significantly from 23% in uh, to 2013 to uh, around 18% 80, in before the pandemic. Lapidia was also performing well in 2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2013-2
2023, the National Resili Resilience Framework and the financing strategy to accompany the current National Socio-Economic Development Plan. We have also set out lofty goal to achieve 2030 agenda, which include, among other, reducing the greenhouse gas emission by 60 percent, increasing forest cover cover to 70 percent of total land area, promoting increased use of uh, green energy through a 30 percent share of electric vehicle. 10% bio fuel and improving water management practices. Through the challenge, we have grown many various uh, lessons and way forward to need greater effort to address uh, the lesson learned from last year uh, that uh, we would like to share with you. On the first one is the commitment, strong the government strong commitment and ownership to the 2030 agenda lie within the greater involvement of Lai Ministry and provincial authorities. Therefore, building the capacity is great important to ensure effective translation of the government commitment into action for localization, integration, and reporting on SDG. Second, Administrative data, data system it many goals it still need to be harmonized, streamlined, and strengthened. With will enhancing institutional and stat statistical capacity building, the engagement, inclusiveness, and particip participatory of all the stakeholders in the society is crucial to ensure that no one is leaving behind. Four, the support from development partner and international organization are fundamental in providing ratio and knowledge to accelerating the SDG action. Last but not least, public awareness for SDG is important for ensuring creative support and partnership which are essential for SDG uh, re realization. I would like to conclude my uh, presentation by reiterating that the, to achieve the lofty goal to sustainable development would be impossible without partnership and cooperation of all partners and stakeholders particularly in the challenging time of the global crisis since the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, this breakup, we would more than ever bilateral and multilateral cooperation and solidarity in order to release uh, the global agenda that we set to achieve together in this regard. I would like to, to reaffirm the commitment of our government to eradicate poverty and pursue the path of sustainable development and will continue to work closely with our part partner and in ensuring the attainment of SDG in 2013. I thank you. He is the chief, uh, conservator for WWF Malaysia. Yeah. I apologize. He's got a, a PhD <laughs> in social sciences from the University of Helsinki. So welcome in from the call. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, you know, a typical absent minded professor. Right. Um, <laughs> No, uh, thank you, uh, Prof, for, for inviting me to uh, speak on this session with, with such a distinguished uh, speakers. Now, this session is about uh, the next steps yeah, in strengthening uh, sustainable uh, development in ASEAN. So, in, in framing this, uh, this presentation, I have depended on um, the keynote address that I have developed uh, for my organization as, as we celebrated our 50th year anniversary last year. So, this, this statement that you are seeing right on the screen here, 
is actually our vision statement, which is to reverse the loss of nature uh, and transform the country and Malaysia into a sustainable nation by 2030. This is a lifelong uh, you know, journey of myself. I, I, I must thank my, uh, my teacher uh, up in, uh, when I was in, in Form 6, yeah, when we were doing uh, you know, a, a, a Qatar's arm. And that framed my thinking about, about sustainability uh, for the country, although I didn't know the word then. Now, there will be two parts of my presentation. The first is about nature conservation, and the second is so what, yeah, uh, which is to then transform the country into a sustainable nation. So um, when I was uh, being, being invited to, to hold this position uh, back in 2018, my, I was also asked to develop the, the, the 10-year strategy for my organization, the Real Malaysia. And through a series of, um, um, of uh, discussion, we have come up with this, uh, this statement, yeah, which I mentioned earlier. Now, what, what do we mean by a sustainable country? Uh, so looking back into Malaysia, we then, um, through three years of thinking, which is a very long time you know, in, terms of, in, in terms of the formulation of our strategy, we, we define 10 attributes, 10 criteria of how we define Malaysia to be a sustainable nation. So there are the 10 goals here. The first is to write on our government's policy and our government's commitment back in 1992 during the first Earth Summit yeah, uh, in which our country has pledged to retain our country, uh, you know, half the country as forest. And also, uh, through a two years analysis, uh, WRF has, has done uh, from information that we have obtained uh, throughout the country, we found that the, the percentage of our forests that have been legislated is, is at 48%. Yeah, it's only 2% left to go. Now, in, in this remaining 2% um, um, that we have done, that, that, that is needed to be established, we have supported the governments here yeah, to, to have new protected areas. And just on Monday, uh, working with the Pahang government, uh, the Crown Prince uh, has announced that he's working with us uh, to, to, dig, to have Fraser's Hill you know, to be gazetted as a protected area which is a very important achievement because it's right on the mountains. Um, in Sarawak, there are a lot more uh, efforts to be done. Uh, the government has a, a few more, about at least 1.7 million hectares of land to be gazetted. And we are working the state government to identify new approaches in, in, in getting this land to be, to, to be gazetted. Now, um, talking about gazetment is based on the legal process. And what we have seen is that um, the, the government of Sarawak has difficulties getting more land to be, to be gazetted because of the very restrictive uh, forest ordinance. Uh, when you gazet uh, a, a place to be protected, you are basically excluding the rights of people living there, and many of these people are in, you know, a, a local community. So they have objected to the, to the establishment of, 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 you know, of the protected forest. So what we then see is to go back into in international instruments such as, such as the CBD, uh, um, the two, corp, uh, two conference of parties ago, they have adopted uh, what we call OECM, Other Effective Conservation Management Area, uh, which allows uh, non-governmental areas to be protected. So this includes, you know, uh, community areas, or what we call ICCA, Indigenous Community Conservation Area. That includes, you know, communities, uh, land and resources into, in, into protected areas. Now the second goal is that uh, we, we um, three years ago we were looking into uh, looking into forests. Yeah, we have a lot of forests in Malaysia, but many of us know that our forest is much degraded. So our goal then is to restore at least a million hectares yeah, of that degraded forest. Now a lot, two years ago, uh, the Ministry of Finance Malaysia has allocated uh, a huge sum of money to the WRF, and we we utilize that funding to assess the forest condition of Malaysia. And uh, using the high carbon stock uh, uh, methodology, looking at intact forests as well as degraded forests, we found that some 6.6% of our forest reserves are degraded in various categories of degradation. Some you don't need to do anything, the trees will grow by themselves. Others you really have to invest. Yeah? Uh, and that 6.6% amounts to some, some 700,000 hectares yeah, to be restored. And forest restoration is not cheap, it's not just planting trees but you also got to maintain them yeah, uh, um, at least five years before they can, they can mature on their own. So from our assessments, uh, uh, the cost of forest restoration is about 1,500 US dollars per hectare, and you just multiply, multiply by five, yeah, five years. And you multiply by the number of, uh, uh, the 100,000 hectares to be restored is about billions that we don't have here. Yeah. 
So it's, it's very crucial to identify financing to, uh, to, to undertake the process duration. Now the third is that uh, we must ensure that all our commodities, particularly uh, that are produced in natural space, must be um, produced in a sustainable manner through uh, compliance with, with, with certification. So half of the country is under forest. 20% uh, will we, we'll be under protected areas, and that leaves 30% of Malaysia to be uh, produced in a sustainable manner. So we must ensure that 30% of the country, millions of hectares of the timber that we have must be produced in a sustainable manner that allows you know, uh, the services that forest provides to be, to be continued. And beyond the, the forested areas, which is actually plantations, so we are very, we, we very happy that the government has actually um, capped a limit of 20% which is 6.5 million hectares of Malaysia's land to be under palm oil. So we must ensure that palm oil is, uh, is, in, is being produced in compliance with certification. And in these days of, quote unquote, you know, a global trade wars, the EU, the European Union has uh, uh, set up the, the European Union um, regulation on deforestation on six commodities around the world, soya bean, coffee, and of course palm oil as well. We must ensure that our palm oil is produced in a way that can get access into, into the EU. Uh, and rubber is the next thing because it's also a very important commodity. So these top three uh, goals uh, pertain to the terrestrial part of Malaysia is, is important. I will skip goal four and, and three which, uh, which pertain to the marine conservation. Now all of these places that we work on, protected areas, forest reserves, you know, commodities, to ensure that uh, the space that we have is important for wildlife conservation. So our goal number five is to ensure that all the uh, priority species, you know, uh, indicator species are well uh, managed. And in this case, uh, Malaysia is, uh, has two very important uh, uh, framework that I, I believe uh, would be outstanding of into, into, into the international community. One is on Hart of Borneo, where the three countries, of Brunei, Malaysia and Indonesia, have committed to, to, to manage this space in a, in, a, in a coherent manner. In Peninsula Malaysia, where we are, is the Central Forest Bank Master Plan which uh, keeps all our forests to be intact. And with this kind of, uh, of conservation framework, we will ensure that our wildlife can be well protected. Now the seventh goal is very crucial in the era of climate change. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Professor John, has mentioned that we are now already um, heading towards 1.2 degrees Celsius of our global warming above the industrial age. We're heading towards two and then three degrees Celsius. So we have developed this strategy to urge our country to be ambitious to adopt a net zero pathway for the country. And of course, this was committed uh, in, in, uh, in, in COP, uh, uh, of the conference COP in, in, in Glasgow two years ago. So we have achieved that in the sense that the, the country has, has pledged for that. Now, what is important is to understand what are the pathways for the country to go to, towards net zero. Uh, so two years ago, uh, the, the Boston Consulting Group came to us to undertake a study and to identify the net zero pathway. And this report, you can, you know, it's called Securing the Future uh, um, uh, Net Zero for Malaysia. It's, it's available in our website. You can just download it. Now, why it's important is that um, the, through the, the binary update report of 2016, uh, Malaysia's report to the UN, um, three quarters of our carbon emission uh, comes from two sectors energy and transportation. So it's very crucial to identify sectors and subsectors within th these two uh, industries, energy and transportation, to go towards net zero. And we're very happy that our government uh, in the Chua Malaysia plan in parliament has announced that we will phase out new coal-fired plants. This is a very really big deal because even if you drive at your EVs, your, your EV source is coming from coal-fired plants. Yeah, it's still, it's still you know, produced from dirty energy. So it's very important that we as a country lock ourselves out of, of, the, of the dirty energy. And that makes Malaysia into a very competitive you know, global trading nation, uh, especially in the, in the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism from EU. So it makes Malaysia very competitive. So this on the carbon uh, um, decarbonizing Malaysia. On the other part, it's about uh, how our forest is a green lung. It absorbs our carbon. Yeah? So, uh, the 2016 carbon emission, 75% of our emissions are absorbed by our forests. And that leaves 75 million tons of uh, uh, GHG uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. Now, this 75 million tons uh, to achieve net zero for Malaysia by 2050 requires only about 300 billion to 500 billion 
dollars uh, uh, over the next 30 years. Now, if you divide this over 30 years, it's about less than 1 billion uh, US dollars. And this 1 billion US dollars represents only less than 1% of our GDP. So you make this comparison to our GDP, less than 1% investment needed to achieve net zero is very, very cheap. And this is because of our forests. Yeah? Therefore, it's very crucial to um, maintain our forest cover, yeah, to restore them. And of course, when you talk about climate change, we, you also need to talk about adaptation. Yeah? Therefore, uh, it's very crucial that we keep our forests intact uh, so that you know, the services that um, the forest provides can be there. It, it reduces the impact of, um, um, of soil erosion and flooding and so forth. Yeah, so we call it nature-based solutions to address uh, the impact of climate change. I will skip uh, goal number eight, which is plastics, uh, and I will then look at goal number nine and number ten. Now, goal number nine is about uh, helping the country to have sustainable infrastructures. It is very important that the roads that we built do not cause irreversible damage to nature. Once the road has been built across our forests, the damage is irreversible because there will be subsequent development coming out. So it's about where you build the road, avoiding as, as much as we can of the forests that we have, and we have no choice but to build road across the mountains. We make sure that the impact has been reduced. Yeah? So we are very happy that we will be supporting the government uh, of Malaysia uh, to develop a new integrated program under the JAF-8, uh, the Global Environmental Facilities on Sustainable Infrastructure. So there will be a new road um, that Sabah is going to build to right upon the, the new capital of Indonesia, which is a green capital. And Sabah uh, attempts to build a road across to, to get access. So we want to help the government build a good road yeah, to, to, to minimize the, the destruction to the environment. And the 10th goal is about working with the, financial, uh, with the financing uh, is, uh, institutions, the banks and so forth, to uh, adopt ESG's compliance yeah, into the financing. Here we're working with Central Bank, uh, the, the City Commission, uh, particularly on a committee led by, uh, by, by the bank on Joint uh, Committee on Climate Change, JC3. Here we're working with the, with the top levels of, of the decision-making level of the banks to ensure ESG is, is being in compliance. Now, all these 10 goals, when put together, would then result in what we call the, the, the bending the curve of biodiversity loss. For the last 30, 40 years, we are facing a great decline, uh, loss of species, loss of habitat, and so forth. And we believe with this kind of adoption of very comprehensive, measurable targets, you know, and looking at sub-targets as well, we are actually able to reverse the loss. I think for Malaysia, we are coming to the threshold that we can bend that curve. And we believe that over time, uh, basically when the 50% the of Malaysia is well covered by forests, integrated, fragmentation has been reduced, forest restored and so forth, we will then uh, have more and more species in the country. And how we do that is then looking on the ground of what is an example for Sabah. Uh, we working with the Sabah government and stakeholders to em embrace this uh, living landscape approach in which we are putting all the elements of uh, our threats towards conservation, uh, all the goals of sustainable development together as a framework called the living landscape approach. It has three pillars, protect, produce, and restore. Protect all the things that are important for conservation and sustainable development, the services that nature provides. Yeah? And they work with the commodities, the palm oil, the logging industry, and so forth, to ensure that our commodities, our palm oil, are produced in a way in which they support conservation. And when uh, plantation um, 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 managers have understood conservation, they know they are the problem. And one of the problems is this forest fragmentation. Government has given them concessions to, to do plantations, and that plantation has resulted in the fragmentation. So the solution is to restore the forest, yeah, to reconnect them. So the third pillar is about restoration, planting back uh, a forest. And by having this notion of the 10 goals that we have, looking at what Malaysia has already done, uh, the, the framework that we have, we then look into this notion of seeing the country as half glass full against half glass empty. And then for the last 30 years, we are very negative. We see everything is, 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 is been declined. We feel very desperate. So it's a half glass, full, uh, half glass empty kind of syndrome. But having a philosophy of looking at half glass full, we are building upon what we already have. And that will then transform our thinking in, in helping the country to be more sustainable. And I'll end my slide uh, by, by having this thought. All the 10 goals 
when put together, can be summarized by this diagram here. On the left is where nature is, where the forest is, where the habitat for wildlife is. It's the same forest that we have, that we have converted to elevate poverty, you know, eradication. And, and one of them is palm oil plantation. So with this illustration of the palm oil industries from, from upstream to downstream, to, 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 to grading the supply chain, we will find that Malaysia can live in, in harmony with nature in the future. So by going to the, into the consumer side, making sure that our consumers around the world want to buy from Malaysia because they know that Malaysia's uh, commodities are well produced in support of conservation for the tigers, for the orangutan and the elephants, then it will place a, a demand for our products. And then the supply chain will eventually be heading towards that. Yeah. So, so in the end, uh, it generates new economy for Malaysia. Of what various speakers in this session has spoken, uh, has spoken about, about you know, uh, it's a green economy. It, it, it results in, in creating new jobs because we are now retaining the, the raw materials in the country to build into a new uh, economy. It creates new jobs, it creates new products, and therefore it would then you know, uh, lift up our economy. So at the end of the day, it will become a very attractive place for our investments for Malaysia. Now, I, I just want to go back to what our chairman, uh, who is also the chairman of Malaysia Stock Exchange, he says that the value of our stocks in Malaysia is depressed by 20% because many of our stocks do not have a climate transition plan. You know, investors wouldn't dare to invest in you because you, you don't know where your investment is heading. So with this kind of uh, framing of our, our economy, Malaysia becomes a very safe haven for, invest, for investments. We are, uh, we are a country that has addressed climate change. We have addressed a lot of nature, and we are putting in place standards in terms of, um, uh, in terms of sustainability. So I believe with this kind of uh, vision for the country, it will leave the whole of society approach to support uh, the country uh, heading towards, uh, towards, towards this journey of sustainability. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So, Jeff, you, you are the next speaker, or the others are just to their new seats on stage? Thank you very much. That, that was uh, wonderful, and you got a better treat than hearing from me. Uh, so I'll, I'll just wrap up a, a few observations about this very, very successful workshop because I think we've covered a lot of ground for ASEAN and we've heard a lot of things that are very promising. And that's good because we need some uh, optimism and some direction for uh, how to uh, overcome some of, some of the big challenges right now. If we were to step back from our crises and look at uh, some of the very um, fundamental trends in the world, we'd have a great deal of reason for, for optimism, in fact. Uh, the world economy and world society as a whole has become much better off than it was 100 years ago without question. Life expectancy has risen remarkably, income in the world on average is now $20,000 per person if measured at international prices and about $12,000 per person if measured at market prices. And this is a huge rise of incomes and well-being and uh, quality of diets, protection, uh, of health care coverage and many, many other uh, really fundamental parts of our material life. And what Dr. Zhao described for China, which is absolutely incredible, for 1.4 billion people over a period of 40 years, um, has been achieved not quite at that pace, but very broadly in many parts of the world. And the underlying reason for those improvements is that science, technology, know-how has advanced 
and continues to advance even at an accelerating rate. So our ability to address practical challenges is really unprecedented right now. Our wealth is unprecedented and our know-how is unprecedented. This is really the fundamental reason for being uh, very optimistic about what we can do and what we should do in the coming years. What we've learned, though, is that there are at least three fundamental problems with the way the world functions. And that's what brings us to this workshop and what brings us to the Sustainable Development Goals. The first is that with all that progress, there are billions of people that have been effectively left behind this progress that are really struggling for a variety of reasons. People live in more remote areas or in very unfavorable geographies or are part of minority groups that have been maltreated within societies or half the population, women and girls that traditionally were not part of the market economy, were part of the household economy and have definitely seen uh, progress but facing a lot of social obstacles still today, which is why one of the Sustainable Development Goals is directed specifically at the issues of gender, SDG 5. So one of the three huge challenges is that we have a rich world and a lot of very poor and suffering people within that world. And that's just, uh, I think for most of our, us, humanly unacceptable. And indeed, when the UN was established in 1948, all of the member states agreed that there should be basic standards of life for every person on the planet because they're people on the planet, because they're human beings. And the world is productive enough to ensure the dignity of everybody. And that's why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. And I regard us still trying to honor that declaration, which seems to me to be the basic point. So problem number one is the very uneven development, the fact that there is still today uh, a significant part of the world that lives in really abject deprivation. And that's a, a first challenge. And I think it's ethically probably the number one challenge because extreme deprivation in a world of plenty is absolutely uh, destructive of all of our humanity if we don't solve that problem. So that's why SDG 1 is end extreme poverty. Straightforward. And SDG 2, the second highest priority, is end hunger for heaven's sake. Of course, there are big challenges of how to do it, but I will say in a world of wealth and knowledge, this is definitely within reach. It's crazy to my mind that if the average income is $12,000 per capita, there are people living at a few hundred dollars per capita and the world just goes on as they suffer and die young and face terrible hardships. The second big challenge, the huge challenge, the puzzle that is even harder than the first one conceptually is that we discovered about 50 years ago that the nature of our economic development, all that wealth that I just talked about, is environmentally destructive because the much vaunted economic processes don't take care of their physical byproducts. 
and some of them were not understood till 50 or 100 years ago, like greenhouse gases and their effects on climate. That, was, that required a scientific breakthrough of a quite deep order to understand that. It came by the end of the 19th century, and then it took at least uh, 75 years to create measurement systems to verify the science. And we've more or less known from around 1980 that humanity is really changing the climate in ways that could be dangerous. And we're still struggling with that fact because what brought us that wealth in the first place starting in the 1800s was fossil fuels. And then we discovered about halfway through, oh, those are dangerous. That's not good. So this is the second big problem is that we have an economic system and a set of laws, rules, regulations, a global commons, the open seas, and many other factors of our economic system that mean that uh, the scale of production is now self-destructive. And as I say, we've understood this intellectually at least for 70, uh, at least for about 50 years. Uh, it was 50 years ago that the first conference on this fact took hold. It was 51 years ago that the first good book about this, Limits to Growth, was written and made clear that there was a real problem. And we've not finished solving that problem. But let me stipulate the following, just like I did for the first one. There's nothing fundamental about these environmental challenges that is beyond our solution, even with our current knowledge base. In other words, we already, in 2023, have the range of technical solutions to 90% of the greenhouse gases, not 100%. We definitely don't face a choice between food and nature. We face a choice between, uh, un between destructive and non-destructive forms of food production. That's a very different choice. I haven't found in 40 years of my work on this a fundamental barrier to economic well-being and environmental sustainability. So I'm not in the degrowth school of thought which says that what we really need is to reverse economic development. Not all economic development is good for human well-being. That's a different matter. But I'm not of the school of thought that says we've created a kind of society that is completely inconsistent with our environmental necessities or our environmental well-being or health. What we have is a very flawed economic system, legal system, regulatory system, incentive structure, so that we adopt or continue with technologies that are very ill-advised and do lots of stupid things because it's possible to make money off of those stupid things rather than do the things that we should be doing. And I've not seen in all of my experience any calculations that show me that, this, that doing the right things is beyond our reach, beyond our budget, beyond our uh, economic means. For example, all of the estimates about the energy transformation to a zero carbon energy system suggests that it's one or two percent of world output that is needed to make that change. That's really strange. It's not that it's 50 percent of world output that's needed. It's not that this is cataclysmically expensive and we're just doomed as if an asteroid were coming to hit the planet and we have nothing to do. 
No, we have clear, very, very clear things to do. Sometimes we have too many possible things to do, so we don't know which one to take, so we're paralyzed. Should we do wind or solar or nuclear or this? I don't know. We won't do anything right now. We're making money with what we're doing, so we're paralyzed. Or we know what to do, but there are strong vested interests saying don't do it because I'm making too much money in the short term doing the destructive things. Or it just is complicated and hasn't been thought out properly because this is something absolutely new. It was rather straightforward to build a coal plant, but it's not so straightforward perhaps to build offshore wind or solar fields or something else because of storage or other issues. So there are just complexities. But that's the second big category of challenge that we face, which is this economic environmental collision course, which again needs analysis and then needs to ask, how deep is the problem? And for me, and how solvable is the problem? So the climate crisis is very deep, but it's also rather solvable. And there are some puzzles, definitely. What should big ocean tankers run on? Should it be hydrogen fuel cells? Should it be ammonia? Should it be hydrogen combustion? I'm not an engineer. I've heard the arguments from the engineers. I want them to fight it out. I want them to try different approaches, but clearly we should be trying these technology lines. The th third big challenge, which is a challenge of time immemorial, is that we seem to have a very hard time to stop killing each other. So war becomes all ever more dangerous because the weapons become ever more destructive. And now we're technologically so smart that we figured out how to destroy the whole humanity. Damn it. If we weren't so smart, we wouldn't have this trouble. But a few geniuses figured out you could make nuclear fission work to make a bomb. By the way, there were probably 50 people in the world that understood that. And they figured it out, and then they gave it to a world of idiots. So we have a lot of dumb people who are in charge of nuclear weapons, and they were made by a few geniuses. That's our problem. So this is our third issue, which is how to stay peaceful and cooperative. To my mind, these are the three big issues that we face, which is how to be fair and decent to people who are suffering, how to make sure that we're not self-destructive because our economic system is actually a complicated set of incentives that doesn't get things right, and there's no magic in how we have organized our economic life to handle issues like greenhouse gases, which weren't in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and are not part of the uh, things that uh, a free market can solve, and so forth. And the third is this interminable problem that if you read human history, we've been fighting with each other most of the time. But there are also glimmers of hope that there are long periods of peace. And we also have institutions for peace, just like we have institutions for war. One of the things that makes me quite optimistic about China's rise is that China has been much more peaceful in its history than just about any other region of the world. And the amount of interstate war of China over the last 2,000 years is actually quite low. It's basically been wars of uh, 
pastoralists coming from the north uh, and uh, sedentary farmers trying to fight them off. Uh, and that's been most of China's wars for 2,000 years. If you look at Europe's wars, it was just kill each other across the divide for 1,000 years, nonstop. Um, so China, at least, has a peaceful tradition. And I think it fits, actually, with this idea of harmonious uh, society, with the idea of uh, global civilizations and so forth. I'm quite an optimist, I have to say, about that, because I think it uh, actually there's a, a deep rootedness. So that's all we have to do. End poverty, protect the environment, stop killing with each other. All right? So thank you. No, OK. So, no. so what do we do? To my mind, the basic thing is we should think hard about each of those things and then come up with plans. That's the most basic idea. That sounds so dumb. Why am I saying that after 40 years? Don't I have anything more intelligent to say? And the thing is that the way that our social systems work is not to think and then solve these things. And that's very interesting. Our economic system is designed around a different principle, which is let people do what they want, get rich, go find your job, go uh, buy what you want, but not solve problems. So in economic land, it's not oriented towards solving problems. It's oriented towards doing your thing. Businesses are supposed to go make profits, and we're supposed to be good consumers, and we're supposed to be smart in the job that we pursue. But at least in market economics, which is, became the dominant uh, ideology of the Anglo-Saxon world and then the world, it isn't to solve problems. It's go do your thing. So don't expect the answers to these problems to come from the economic sphere or from the business community. It's not their job. Their job is to run a business. It's to make money. So that's problem number one, that we don't think in the economic sphere about end goals. We're supposed to just do our thing. And then politicians. In most politics, it's not about solving problems. It's about maintaining power. And that's even the goal. And you have experts on maintaining power. All the politicians have little Machiavellis around them, handing them, this is what you need to do to stay in power. And that's your goal. And so politics, at least in my country, has very little to do with any goals. I don't know what any American goals are. We have no goals. We have some heroes, our founding fathers. We love the Constitution. We like the July 4th Independence Day. But we have no goals. And even when I hear Dr. Zhao talk about China's goals, you could not have that in the United States, stating those goals. Because that's, that's, that's socialism. Uh, you're not allowed to have goals. So politics is not oriented towards solving problems, really. It's management, management of power, competition for power holding on to power, benefiting from power. And so we don't see from our governments most of the time these big goals and how to solve them. I really think China's been different in this period, the last 40 years, from most other governments. And I think the success is a result of that, actually, that it's really 
and why? Well, I think this is a very interesting question, but um, a few countries at a few times have very clear goals, maybe because of survival, maybe because of their past history, maybe because they have a successful uh, neighbor, uh, so they want to imitate the success, maybe like in Singapore because uh, a genius came, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, and he had a very, very clear idea. And really, Singapore, it is a case of a very clear, brilliant thinker who just guided things for quite a while, like uh, Plato's philosopher King. But most of the time, this is not how politics is. So we don't see a lot of this problem solving coming from governments. And the third thing is, in my country, which became the most powerful country in the world for uh, the last 75 years militarily, they really think that fighting wars is a big part of what governance is about. They're crazy and dangerous and could get us all killed. So that third category of just peaceful cooperation does not come easily. Every day we read something hateful about China in the American newspapers now. Every single day. I just read uh, today, China has the Global Civilizations Initiative. Wonderful. You talked about it. Today I just read, this is terrible. This is, you know, out to, China's out to take over the world through this. <laughs> now, honestly, this is a mindset that is very, very deep, probably ingrained evolutionarily in us also, because there probably was a time when whoever could control the next water hole survived and whoever didn't, didn't survive, and it was us or them. And that's not how the world is right now. It's not us or them. We don't need to take over any other place to have well-being, period. There's no crisis of living room. There is only the crisis of understanding don't kill the other side. OK, so what do we do? Again, just to conclude, we need to think clearly about these challenges. And John Thwaites mentioned uh, the pathways, which became my favorite word about 10 years ago, which is to think through step by step how, we want, how we're going to get to where we want to go. And it's like the planning process. It's like NDRC. It's like thinking, OK, to be in 2050 in a prosperous society, Let's get out all the tools we know. And that's hard work. That's why we have PhD programs to study that, because everyone has just a piece of that knowledge. And when we heard the session just before this one about peatland, for example, I know nothing about peatland at all. But it sounds really important. So I'm very happy that there are people that really know about peatland. And I want to ask them, what do we do about it? <laughs> Give us a plan. Don't expect me to know, but you tell us. So we need a lot of expertise. We need a lot of thinking. We need a lot of uh, scholarly uh, understanding of these issues. And then we need to take seriously the goals that we've set to say what's the best we can do. So it's really trying to reason our way to success. And at the same time, explaining as part of that reason, don't expect this to come out of a business. Don't expect this to come out of self-serving short-term politicians. They can still do their thing. There must be a place in the world for them. But their job also is to implement something serious for us and for my grandchildren. So that's what I want them to do. 
there's a limit to how much bullshit we should take from them. Excuse me. That's a technical term about American politics. So we need really to put serious ideas forward in detail. And that's the purpose of what uh, we're after and two specific pathways that we're really focusing on right now is one is the energy transition because there's only a quarter century and an energy system's really complicated. You have to have a power grid. We have to convert all the vehicles to electric or to hydrogen or to some other non-emitting source. The building sector has to be far more efficient. Industry emits a lot of greenhouse gases. Deforestation, in other words, all of the getting to net zero is quite a complicated challenge with lots of moving parts and it's a lot of money. Not more than, not more than an energy system costs, but an energy system is trillions of dollars a year and so it's worth getting right. So that's the first of the pathways. And the second is the land use and ocean use because we're really so close to destroying everything irreversibly. When the species is lost, it's never coming back. And when the ecosystems are degraded, many of them never return. And if we pass climate thresholds, we're just going to spend the next century in disaster of calamitous sea level rises, storms, heat waves, and so on. So we're very close to that. So those are the two main pathways that we are really focusing on, the biological and its, associated, its association with food production and with other agricultural production. And for this region, that's central because this is a biodiversity uh, garden of Eden and also a biodiversity threatened region intensively. All this beauty and it's being torn down. And it can happen so fast because economies are very, uh, very, very large right now and demands, China could deforest this country just by its demands for tropical hardwoods without a problem unless you take care. So those are the two areas that we really want to focus on. And the final point that I want to say is uh, again about this third category of cooperation. It happens that when you look technically at an energy program or at a ecosystem program, no country can do this by itself. Nothing can be done other than at the local level, but plans need to be transnational without question. So there's a lot of local action, but they have to be part of a broader framework. And that's why this is an ASEAN workshop because ASEAN countries are not only together on the map and not only physical neighbors but have work to do together because ASEAN countries cannot achieve their goals without working together. And so we need to do this at a transnational planning level. That's hard because there are no elected transnational officials anywhere. All transnational organizations are weak because none of them has an army. None of them has political leaders. We're organized at the national level in the world. That's where the physical force lies. And yet, and that's where the politics generally lies. And yet we have global and regional problems that need addressing urgently. 
the Mekong is not going to be saved one country at a time. It's going to be saved by China, Lao PDR, Cambodia, Vietnam working together. Without question, there's no way to do that one country at a time. It's got to be done in the watershed. The energy system for Malaysia absolutely needs to be integrated with the rest of the region. And those regional institutions are weak politically and organizationally. And they need to be strengthened considerably. And then uh, the question of what region is the right region for this. We're dealing with ASEAN because it's a it, crucial, established regional entity. But I said yesterday, and I'll say it again, I think for the energy sector, RCEP is even more appropriate. That's adding in ASEAN plus China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. The United States would have a fit, by the way. I'll, I'll be done in one minute. <laughs> the US would have a fit. You're cooperating with China? Well, my strong advice to you is cooperate with China closely. And my strong advice to Australia is don't build a submarine base, cooperate with China. And let's not waste money on nuclear submarines right now and raise the tension more. So my own advice is that broader group, and I hope India joins that group, and then we've got a lot of the world together in a way that could actually solve the problems. So sorry for the long rambling, except I believe that all of these problems are solvable. I believe that universities have a unique and extremely important role to play in this, because this is what we should be doing. Training, teaching, educating, researching, policy analysis, and really trying to make politics work the way that it should, which is for the common good. Thank you. We have uh, come to the end of the time, but what I would do is I would take three short questions from the audience, and then we would go and ask our panelists. And when you do ask your question, I would like you that to not make a speech, <laughs> just a question. The speech, you can make it outside after the session is over. And uh, if it is addressed to a specific individual, say who it is. So give your name and your affiliation. Hi, Professor Wu. It's been a long time. I'm Arul. Uh, I just have an open question to the panel um, because uh, I've heard from Dr. Henry. He talked about supply, uh, sustainable supply chain networks. But I believe this is uh, because supply chain is the second most critical industry or oldest industry in the world, and it plays a huge part in the contribution towards ESG sustainability. The but question, sir? There's not much research out there that talks about this and the transformation that's needed. What's your thoughts? That's the question. Thank you. Uh, and the lady who was right here, Tanka. No, no, down here. Please. Oh, right. Oh, they all look alike to you, too. <laughs> I've got poor eyes. <laughs> yes. Please. Hello, uh, I'm Wan Zuhainis uh, from University of Putra, Malaysia. Um, I've been listening. Thank you for all the um, presentations and uh, inputs. Uh, I would like to ask the panels uh, on your view on education for sustainable development, because we have seen, we have heard a lot of uh, talk about research uh, and um, I think in Malaysia uh, ourselves um, we are not very um, we don't emphasize much in um, education for sustainable development 
in terms of uh, not just focusing on um, SDG 4 or Mission 4.7, but cut across the how we can contribute, we can produce our, our uh, graduates, our talents to have that knowledge, attitudes, values and skill. Uh, for a sustainable future. So how, how, what will be our moving forward with education uh, to emphasize more on this ESD? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yi Xiang. Uh, so I would like to address my question to Dr. Henry. So you shared about the strategic uh, plans for WWF Malaysia, and I know you skipped goal number eight regarding plastic because of time constraint, but I'm just curious to know how would the strategic plan for WWF help to um, help our country to uh, strengthen the commitment in plastic combustion and as we see, and maybe like how to lead the whole regional effort in plastic issues as we see like 2030 agenda, we have only seven years and also like the formulation of the Global Plastic Treaty. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Henry, you answered that particular question and then the other two questions are open up to the, the, the panel. Thank you, Isa. So first of all, we had to uh, make people realize that plastics is harmful for nature. You know, when plastics bags float in the ocean, they resemble jellyfish. And jellyfish is eaten by turtles. So you can imagine <laughs> when the turtles see the floating plastic, they damage, yeah, and they will kill them. But on top of that, plastic will also degrade and will break down into microplastics. So microplastics is very, very minute. They can be also be eaten by, by, the, by the corals or the planktons. And small fish eat plankton, and we in turn eat the, the big, big fish, so we will, we will also ingest plastics. That's, that's one way of trying to get people, you know, get excited or angry about plastics. Now, on the solution side is, we're working with uh, several organizations, uh, with the plastic producers, <coughs> with the government, on a program called EPR. EPR stands for Standard Producer Responsibilities. So if you go to um, the European countries, you buy a bottle of Coca-Cola, they'll charge you extra by one euro, and then you put the plastic, the bottle back into the machine, one euro will come back. Right? That's the source of EPR. So in the sense that when you buy your stuff, you <coughs> pay in advance something, and the reward is that when you put it back into the circular economy, you get a return. So that's one way of trying, uh, a, a way to simplify the EPR uh, context. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next two questions for the rest of the panel has to do with the the supply chain, how, how would one handle uh, the, the, the challenges that it's facing and its relationship sustainability. The second question has to do with education for sustainable development. So let me start with, Prof. with Mr. Sofam Vanoa. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, in my uh, opinion, I would like to emphasize that our region, in particular Asian country, uh, need to strengthen together the connectivity uh, in terms of infrastructure and the uh, um, technology and also to the uh, productivity of the region, we need to um, share, uh, we need to be a, a part of a uh, supply chain in the world. That, that's why uh, uh, the ASEAN country uh, need to work together to uh, strengthen the, our uh, <coughs> capacity to product in the future. And then uh, for the education, I would like to uh, uh, Emphasize also that uh, the need for the ASEAN uh, region to um, invest in the social sector like the education and the health uh, sector, uh, which will be uh, at the future because of uh, our region, uh, uh, we, we have a, a, a young population. Uh, uh, with regard to the rest of the world, this is uh, very important for the uh, our action in the future. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
a uh, very uh, quick uh, response uh, for first question. Uh, I do believe the, the fundamental logic uh, of, uh, of the uh, supply uh, chain is, uh, is a division of labor. So, so that's a, a classic uh, economic theory. Uh, the cost effectiveness and the uh, efficiency always uh, the, the fundamental for the supply chain and the industry chain. If so, uh, I think the, 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 the force of the capital is much more important than the politician. So that's my first uh, response. So, so we should, uh, we should uh, uh, believe the, 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 market, uh, the, the force of the market and the force of the capital. And the second uh, question, uh, I think the, uh, for every country and for the, uh, this world, the, the thought, the idea leads the development. But the thoughts, the ideas came from the people. So we need much higher educated people. So that's the relationship between the education and the SDG. Thank you. On the first question, I certainly agree the supply chain is critical, but we have to go beyond the supply chain to the whole value chain. That is what happens to goods and products down the track, and particularly what's the impact on uh, carbon emissions. We're not going to reach net zero if we only look at direct emissions, scope one and scope two emissions. We have to look at what is the scope three, the indirect impact of what we're doing, what product we're selling, and uh, companies need to be reporting on that. And I think that's a real change that is now being introduced to force companies to not only look at their supply chain, but also what happens to the product when they sell it. You see a lot of oil companies now claiming they're going to be net zero by 2050, but they conveniently leave out a calculation of what happens to the oil after they sell it. And so, of course, we're not going to get to net zero in that way. So I think in terms of policies, we should be increasingly requiring companies to report on the whole value chain. In relation to the second question on education for sustainable development, the major point I'd like to make is that young people are already committed. It's not like they have to be told to care about sustainable development or about climate change. They're actually, in my experience, a lot more aware of it than the older generations. We do need to give them the skills to be able to meet these challenges but I, I believe there's a passion there for sustainable development that's probably missing in older people. And I do think that's a lesson for the sustainable development goals, that there needs to be more priority given to young people and the interests of young people in the way we design and implement the goals. In terms of supply chain, I'm trying to tie between what uh, Jeff said and John said about the systems and, and, the, and the supply chain. So specifically, consumer is very important. You as consumer, you will buy the cheapest items right on the shelf. Uh, but if you are an educated consumer, you want to know what impact does it bring for what you're buying. So a lot of people have become, you know, eat organic food and become a vegetarian. So on the project that we're working on, and I must say it's supported by HSBC Bank, the international bank, we're working with Indonesia and Malaysia to ensure that palm oil uh, in important places for conservation, these are the forests, these are the orangutan habitat, are produced in a sustainable manner. We then work with the China and the Indian market. Just imagine if 1% of the Chinese and the Indian consumer was to demand for <coughs> sustainable products and willing to pay a premium price, you would change the whole supply chain. Today, we're only expecting the Europeans to help us here, yeah? and the market is almost saturated there. And we work with, the, with uh, Singapore because most of the palm oil companies are headquartered in Singapore. So you work at the board level. In the board uh, of the companies say that we only export from certain markets, 
We only source on certain markets that are responsible, it will change everything. Yeah, so this tie the two together. Now, in terms of education, uh, again, back on the BRAF, I'm very happy that we just have a new strategy. My, some of my colleagues are here. So the, the goal number one is to work with governments so that the curriculum in the education policy includes sustainable development and environmental education. We work with the teachers at the various universities and the teaching colleges so that the teachers know how to teach the you know, environment, not in the boring subject where people take for examination and forget everything, yeah? something that interests the students. And we work with, with the young kids, with the young students at the university level. You demand for good education because in the, the future lies on, your, on yourself. <coughs> because if you continue to live the world that Prof has mentioned, then you're heading, you're, you're perpetuating a system of degradation. You have to decide your own future and you must tell government what we must do. Thank you. Uh, a, a key concept, of course, of uh, supply chains is uh, the life cycle analysis of a product, which means tracing the impacts all the way through from the primary commodity sources through the end uses. And from as a tool, that is the correct uh, way to understand technologies or to understand products, I should say, and uh, goods and services. A lot of the discussion about supply chains revolves around the fact that trying to make a life cycle analysis work on a market basis is tricky because if in one market there is a regulation, it can just shift the uh, life cycle cost to an unregulated part of the system. And therefore, uh, global supply chains are hard to govern if each piece is responsible only for its own piece, what is the actual life cycle implication of a product uh, can be completely hidden from view in a reporting, regulatory, and incentive manner. And we need to face up to that in a variety of ways because we have a um, whole toolkit of how to address this, but we shouldn't pretend that a tinkering or a single fix here or there solves a problem like the one that we're dealing with. And with the oil companies, as an example, it's not reporting on emissions that's going to solve the emissions problem. It's going to be regulating the use of fossil fuels that will solve the uh, emissions problem. And so, trying to get this from a reporting point of view may have a little bit of merit in certain ways, but it can't be the main policy instrument that is used to solve this problem. And that is just one of a hundred examples of why this is tricky and what rules to put in place of responsibility of a part of the supply chain for the rest of the supply chain is a as an unsolved problem. Having said that, this is why we need to think clearly about all of the major sectors and impacts and whether to use pricing or reporting or regulation and so forth as the tools of choice that are needed in particular contexts because there is no single solution to a complicated problem like this. Finally, uh, just a word about the education because I think it is fundamental. If we're going to think about the solutions, we need to know how to think about them. So we had better be creating educational systems that can address these major societal challenges. And uh, John Thwaites led a wonderful effort, two wonderful efforts, of how to make universities fit for the sustainable development goals. What should universities do to create interdisciplinary programs, to teach in ways that are oriented towards problem solving, 
and to help students learn in the right way. But this is a fantastic learning opportunity because it's very experiential. I think anywhere sixth graders should be addressing the question in their local schools, should we put on a solar panel on our roof? That's a great question for a child anywhere. And then by the time you're in eighth grade, to be asking, is our city sustainable? We want to meet with the mayor. And then by 12th grade, making a sustainable development plan for your state or your community as a work plan for a class for a year. And then go to the state legislature and present it or the minister, that's their job, is to receive these things and to discuss them. And at the university level, to be making a pathway for decarbonization. Because you learn a lot doing this. And because the governments don't know how to do it anyway, so somebody has to do it. We need to get this process underway as an analytical skill set in training. So I think that the educational opportunities are phenomenally large. And uh, as you said, there's nothing boring about this. This is the most interesting thing. We live in the middle of our environment every day. And so understanding it, responding to it, knowing what to do is absolutely should be core to the curriculum, whether it's in science, whether it's in politics, uh, whether it's in history. It's wonderful subject matter. And the SDG Academy, which is based here for the worldwide effort for the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, has that as its core goal, is to help provide curricula and materials for this kind of learning. And we're also introducing in Malaysia and in schools around the world curricula at lower levels from pre-K onward because this is a, a great need and a, and a wonderful way to learn. Thank you. Thank you. We've come to the end of a, a long workshop. So let's give a big hand to our panel. Thank you. And give yourself a big hand too for your long patience. Thank you very much. Have a good Saturday afternoon. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.